very little. Thank you for uh, letting me share my experience on uh, cesarean scar pregnancies. And you gave me a title that uh, really is very pertinent to what we do with these uh, scar pregnancies. And the um, outcome is emphasized in this talk. I also will ask a question later on whether we can really link the uh, early ultrasound features to the prognosis. I have uh, no conflict of interest. Uh, no matter what you hear, read, and think, regardless of its management, cesarean scar pregnancy is a very, very, very dangerous kind of pregnancy. Um, I want to also emphasize that scar pregnancy is not an ectopic pregnancy, at least not to a strict definition. It is in the uterine cavity. It is embedded on the scar or in the dehiscence of a previous cesarean delivery. And unless true ectopic pregnancy, it may result in a live newborn and it calls for different evaluation, different treatment, and it will have a different outcome. We know that it is, uh, scar pregnancies are closely linked to the increasing rates of, uh, of uh, cesarean sections. And uh, we also know that the normally implanted placenta is, goes hand in hand with that. I found an interesting uh, um, uh, statistics in the literature showing the most cesarean sections in different countries. The United States is comfortably in the middle there. And we also have some red states and blue states in terms of uh, who does meet the national target, which is about uh, 25 percent. And you see that these are lower and these are higher as that. And here are the blue and the red states. The red ones are the ones who don't really meet that. It's a man-made disease. Its incidence is placed between 2000, 1 in 2,000, 2,500 deliveries, but lately many, many articles have the impression that it is more like 1 in 1,000 or so. And 52% uh, or half of the scar pregnancies had only one prior cesarean delivery. The more previous the cesarean deliveries, the more scar pregnancies, and of course, the more placenta previa and accreta. And this slide was given to me of, by our pathologist. It's a niche created by the previous cesarean section. And here is the ad, fertilized egg, wanders down, uh, divides, sprouts a tiny little placenta there, and then invades the, um, the myometrium, and here is the accreta and scar pregnancy with its uh, exquisite and rich um, vascularization. The outcome may hinge on the correct diagnosis. It's, uh, Steve always says that you always see the mistakes when you give the, the lecture. Uh, as a matter of fact, I say that all the time. I don't correct it. It's always the same mistake. How, we do, how do we diagnose a cesarean scar pregnancy? Use mainly transvaginal sonography. You can do also transabdominal. But please, please do not use MRI. Disregard these articles and uh, suggestions. Trust your transvaginal ultrasound. Here is how you make the diagnosis. No fetal parts in the cavity or the cervix. The myometrial layer between the bladder and gestational sac is very thin. At the very beginning of the pregnancy, up to about seven weeks, you may see a triangular-shaped gestational sac wedged into the, a niche. You can see that the anterior uterine wall and the bladder are very close to each other. And sometimes, sometimes you already see a, 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 the AV malformation, mostly if the pregnancy is uh, not a viable one. The most important ingredient of a correct diagnosis is to determine its location. And here is the simplest way to determine the location of a pregnancy in the uterus. We wrote this article mainly targeting the, 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 the practitioners out in the trenches. And uh, that's where usually the misdiagnosis is made. And we said that do a panoramic longitudinal sagittal scan 
and on this one determine the location of the sac. Divide the uterus by half by an imaginary line. If the sac is above it, it's mostly a normal implantation. If the sac is below it, suspect a scar pregnancy or a cervical pregnancy given the right position of it. This has a pretty good uh, statistical evaluation. Fine-tuning the diagnosis, basically, you have to measure the bladder to the sac distance. The literature is not only confusing as to the sac location, but rarely is there information about bladder to sac distance or the overlying meriometrial thickness. Furthermore, usually there is no distinction between sac and placenta, which is crucial. And lastly, and probably even more importantly, there is rarely any mention about location of placental vascularization. To correctly measure this distance, we need a precise definition of the implantation, since it may determine outcomes. Sporadically, we hear and read that there may be a distinction between implantation on the scar and in the niche or in the dehiscence. It is very hard to detect any organization, and there are many articles that you read. Comstock says, and she really did a lot of work on this one, and I really look up to her because she was the pioneer of this. She says, low-lying versus surrounded by myometrium. Um, Twickler says, less than one millimeter predicted map in Texas. Naji in the UK, away from the scar, close to the scar, closing the scar, inside the scar. Rack, uh, co-worker of uh, Diane Twickler uh, in, in Texas, smallest anterior myometrial thickness on first trimester sonography significantly improved detection of morbidly adherent placenta. Here are the articles. It is clear to me, at least, that there is no uniform and agreed upon definition of the type and depth of implantation and its correlation to outcome. Here is my understanding of the issue of implantation after years of observation of adherence disorders and scar pregnancies. So here is on the scar, when you have a certain amount of myometrium between the anterior wall, the bladder, and the placenta, the relevant thickness we don't really know. We may have to determine that. And the second one, in the niche, you can clearly see that there is a dehiscence and the placenta is deep in there and you already see the vascularity that is between the uh, placenta and the anterior ones. Always, please, stay focused on the proximity of the placenta to the anterior uterine surface or the bladder. Have you ever looked at the location of the sac? in scar pregnancies, which mainly after seven to eight weeks is being halfway in the uterine cavity. Where else would it go? It goes that way. And then sometimes the practitioners out there say, don't worry, the sac is in the cavity. Well, it is in the cavity, but the important thing is it's still a scar pregnancy. And please rely on the location of the placenta and the vascular supply. This location of the sac may be misleading. Here is what I did a little cartoon here. Six weeks, then you have seven weeks, and then finally at eight weeks, it's in the cavity. And that you have to remember. Is there an entity such as Akrita in the first trimester of pregnancy? Yes, there is. This invasion can be identified if the sac is implanted anterior lower uterine segment and that suggests the possibility of Akrita. Here is a good example of that, it's at seven weeks. The second question, is there an entity as an Akrita in the second trimester of pregnancy? Yes, there is. And here is one image at 14 weeks. It ruptured several weeks later. I have another picture of this one. And the histology was per Krita. The different treatments if termination is required, the major treatment modalities are surgical, major minor, minimally invasive, I use the double balloon, systemic, major or minor, methotrexate or embolization, and then there, is, there are different combinations of the above. This is an article that was published in the Fertility and Sterility, and I don't really, um, 
subscribed to it very much because it totally dismissed the minimally invasive treatments. We wrote one many years ago and found about 30 or more primary treatments in 751 cases. And after that, they surf some more surfaced in the literature. Are there any guidelines? And here is the problem. It's obvious that none of the countries, USA included, have a set of guidelines at hand when a patient with an early placenta or a scar pregnancy presents. The complication rates are great. We found about 44% of them, methotrexate alone 62%, DNC about the same, embolization about 50% of, of complications. Hysteroscopy was uh, pretty good, and local injection at that time when I mostly treated my patients was about 9.6% in the literature. So some of the treatment, let me talk just about two maybe or three of them. Systemic methotrexate, today we have a consensus that it's about 8.7 success if um, used alone. It has a high complication rate. Its slow action may take days, and its a questionable ability of methotrexate to stop the heart requiring often additional treatment. And I will tell you that most of the phone calls that I get for a scar pregnancy are after a methotrexate treatment was given or uh, as a single dose or a multiple dose that did not succeed. Multiple, multi-dose may, uh, may be a little better. Even such treatments fail at times, but it can be used as an adjuvant, and I do use it with other treatments. So here is a systematic review and it asked, what is the best first-line approach for SCAR pregnancies? And they wanted to see the efficacy and safety of the primary treatment modality. It looked at 274 articles, and here are the most important messages of it. Methotrexate, success rate 8.7%, uterine artery 18, hysteroscopy 39, DNC, the, the um, the complications are mostly um, in terms of hysterectomy, and they say uterine art uh, embolization should be reserved for cases with significant bleeding or suspicion for an AVM, I call it later, uh, lately EMV, enhanced myometrial vascularity. Systemic methotrexate and DNC are not recommended as the first line approaches for scar pregnancies as these procedures are associated with high complication in hysterectomy rate, such as in methotrex C3.6 and DNC 7.3%. I used for many, many years transabdominal or end trans transvaginal ultrasound guided local intragestational sac injection of methotrexate. I don't use KCL, but my friend Peter Dubilé in Boston does that and equal success. About 100 cases in the literature with about 9.6, 0 to 15 percent complications. Operative hysteroscopy, there are few cases in the literature, but believe me, if a, a center has a good hysteroscopist, that is the um, the treatment that is done in that, that center. It has about a 40% success rate, and it has a very low complication rate, mostly bleeding, and, uh, uh, and no hysterectomies were published. Suction aspiration and or sharp DNC combined with inflation of a folly balloon uh, is used, and again, you have to understand that you have a rich vascular a web around the scar pregnancies. And this explains the possible bleeding when DNC is done and uh, the scar is subjected to curettage. You can uh, be ready to inflate a single folly balloon to stop the bleeding, and th I used that and published an article um, to, um, to say that. So here are some cases in one of the articles, eight cases of first trimester scar pregnancy treated with DNC. And you can see here that basically most of them had DNC. Then 
they had mostly bleeding and uh, very significant bleeding. This bleeding can appear uh, quite immediately after the procedure or even later, seven, eight weeks later. And they, uh, in this series, had mostly total abdominal hysterectomies. Euthanatal embolization alone or, or in combination with other treatment can be used. It has a failure rate. It is not the best single first-line treatment, but it's a good adjuvant treatment to others. And again, here is uh, again a series of uh, uh, scar pregnancies uh, treated with uh, um, uterine artery embolization, and you can see that it usually was done after DNC um, and the development of an arteriovenous malformation, and they had, um, all of these had embolization. So basically, this is a systematic review and a meta-analysis to compare the efficacy of uterine artery embolization followed by curettage and methotrexate in the treatment of scar pregnancies in China to 725 patients. It said that shortened the time for HCG normalization and reduced blood losses and adverse effects. It, if compared with the administration of methotrexate plus curettage, for patients with scar pregnancy, embolization followed by curettage appears to be more advantageous and may be a priority option. A laparotomy is uh, a, a big weapon. I don't think that laparotomy really should be used, but many um, do that, and I will not talk too much about it. This is the single Foley balloon uh, use that we uh, instituted uh, several years ago. Basically, or as a single treatment, or after we injected the scar pregnancy and in, in put in the balloon and inflated it, and that stopped the bleeding and the heartbeat. Lately, I tried to do a double balloon procedure, published it, and um, that really is a very simple treatment. Uh, we adapt a catheter familiar to the OB in the labor and delivery, and it is also good for cervical pregnancies. And what I do is I, in, I insert the double balloon, inflate the upper one to serve as an anchor balloon, because if only one balloon is, is placed in, that usually uh, that resulted in, in two of the 18 cases in, in, in expulsion. And then I inflate the upper balloon that does the job and um, stops the heartbeat and stops also the bleeding. Here is uh, a very short video because I didn't want to subject you to the whole video. Here is already upper balloon inflated, the scar pregnancy, the lower balloon pushes and constricts the space. And if needed, the upper balloon is still tweaked a little bit, this is topped up in order to do the job. That is how, at the very end, the procedure looks. What is after a detailed evidence-based counseling the patient of excellent continues the pregnancy? So first of all, let's see how scar pregnancy behaves if not terminated. There is sufficient evidence that if left alone, scar pregnancy develops into a morbidly adherent placenta, and you have in your syllabi uh, that I uploaded several of these articles. And here I have to also say that um, as usually, we always change until there is no more time to change. So this morning, about an hour ago, I uploaded the last version. You will probably have it only tomorrow. They published to, uh, to post it tomorrow. So um, we published uh, that the scar pregnancy is a precursor of uh, adherent placenta, and also that they share the same histology. So the conclusion today in the literature is that there is ample evidence that can be used to counsel patients with scar pregnancies to enable them to make an informed consent and informed choice between first trimester termination and continuation of pregnancy when we explain its risk of premature delivery and then a potential loss of the uterus. In the second trimester, there are dangers. There is high risk for complications. Here is 
46 cases and 45 different case reports um, when you have ruptures, embolizations, laparotomies, and AVM development. In the second trimester, if viability is questionable, termination of the pregnancy is problematic. One solution is elective or emergent gravity hysterectomy. And here is a collection of emergent gravity hysterectomies. This one was a patient who was sent to a second opinion. We suggested to terminate. They went elsewhere. They said follow up and watch. Two weeks later, emergency hysterectomy, profuse bleeding at home. This one, one of the cases there of uh, ours that uh, ended up uh, at uh, the place of uh, Tony Vincileos, who had to do a hysterectomy at uh, 20 weeks. Here is one I got from Dr. Cali from Palermo, Italy. Uh, the interesting, it disrupted, but this also has a omphalocele, the fetus. Here is another one that I got from Israel. Now, there are also planned gravity hysterectomies, and these are usually when you, uh, then when the patient does not want to go through the pregnancy. Here is one case from Dr. Kali. This is our case in which uh, we saw a uh, clear uh, sonographic uh, sign of the adherent placenta. At 17 weeks, then we saw a a large hematoma above the pregnancy, and uh, the pregnancy was then terminated with a hysterectomy. So there is an example of what is the evolution of scar pregnancy into the first trimester. At 10 weeks, you already see the signs of it, the lacunae, the vascularization. Later on, at 16 weeks, uh, the uh, vascularity um, polarizes uh, be below the bladder, here is at 23 weeks, 24 weeks, and finally at 30, full-blown placenta accreta in this case. But it was seen already and predicted at 10 weeks and one day. We published uh, 10 uh, such cases of uh, uh, patients who selected to, terminate, to, to, to go and uh, deliver the baby. I have only two or three cases here is one case. At nine weeks already scar pregnancy in the niche. And here you see the vascularity, morbidly adherent placenta, and the specimen. Here is a second one. I show you only these two cases. And uh, um, these were, or maybe another one here, definitely a, a series that showed that you can deliver a, a neonate, but you, pray, you pay the price. Over the last several years, it became obvious that not all scar pregnancies resulted in morbidly adherent placenta. And here is a good article from Nurit Zosmer in the UK. She, had, she published 10 patients, but only five resulted in MAP, leading to hysterectomy. The next question is, can we predict which will become MAP and which will not? We try to learn if there is a difference in pregnancy outcome as a function of the distance between the gestational sac and the anterior uterine uh, surface or uh, uterine the proximity to, to the bladder. And uh, uh, basically, I think that it, uh, we have suspected that there will be a difference between those implanted on the scar on within the niche. Uh, no such studies are available at this time, and we assess the natural development of these uh, pregnancies. So here is one that I'm showing you as a picture. Here is the scar. The placenta is implanted over it, and there is a distance between the placenta and the anterior uterine wall, but the vascularity is already there. Here is another type that's implanted in the niche, and here you barely see any distance. At times there is none of that between the bladder and the placenta and the vascularity is seen. So we had in group A six patients, in group B 11 patients. These were on the scar, these were in the niche. And the delivery time was significantly different being um, shorter in the ones with the niche. They were all morbidly adherent placentae 
Here they had all hysterectomies lost the uterus. The blood uh, loss was not sig significantly different, but uh, it was more in those who had the pregnancy in the niche. What was um, significantly different was the diff distance between the, the, um, the placenta and the anterior wall, here being a range of four to nine, and here being a range of zero to two. So basically, patients with scar pregnancy implanted on the scar had a substantially better outcome uh, compared to patients with in the niche. And the thickness below two millimeters in the first trimester ultrasound was associated with morbidly adherent placenta at delivery. So let's now compare the ultrasound markers of MAP in the second and third trimester. And I think that you all know the, these, so I don't have to really detail them. Uh, low anterior implantation, lacunae, altered bladder line, no anechoic space, increased vascularity. In the first trimester, we have exactly the same kind of um, uh, ultrasound signs um, that uh, I showed you in the later pregnancies. I, I showed very clearly that 100% of the low implantations um, are a marker of a scar pregnancy and a, a future um, possibility of uh, placenta accreta. I also wanted to talk to you about two uh, complications. One would be um, the developing um, enhanced myometrial vascularity that you see after uh, treating these pregnancies. And I wanted to emphasize and let you know that every time we do not empty the uterus or the area of the scar pregnancy, we treat it conservatively, we basically create a retained product of conception. This retained product of conception will have all the signs, symptoms of uh, what you already know from your daily practice of a retained uh, product of conception. They will bleed, and in many cases, they will develop an enhanced myometrial vascularity, also known as AVM or, or, or arteriovenous malformation. This was um, published in the literature, I wanted to show you an article that very clearly shows that relationship between uh, those treated um, scar pregnancies that were not evacuated, and uh, you have to deal with it, and many of these will end up having uterine, arter uh, uterine artery embolizations. And uh, if you have um, these prolonged um, AVMs or EMVs in these cases, um, you should very clearly consider um, embolizing them later on. And the last sentence, and uh, that will be maybe the uh, most important message that I would like to convey to this group here, that when you, um, when you discharge a patient from the hospital after you did a cesarean section, make sure that you tell the patient that we, when she gets pregnant in a future planned or unplanned pregnancy, to run to the obstetrician at six weeks already, five, six weeks, in order to ascertain the location of the pregnancy. Most of the time, of course, it will be in the right position, but if it will be down there, and again, I told you 100% of them are scar pregnancies, please then plan the management of this patient. 